Welcome to Compassion in a T-Shirt. My name's Dr. Stan Steindl. Tonight, I'll be speaking with Dr. Tobin Bell, a clinical nurse and psychotherapist with strong interests and expertise in compassion-focused therapy and chair work. Tobin is a highly respected teacher and trainer of the application of chair work in CFT. In fact, he has a couple of workshops coming up with the Compassionate Mind Foundation, both online and face-to-face. -face. And he's an academic at Manchester University, where he conducts research into all things chair work and CFT. I found this conversation to actually be very inspiring for me, and I hope it might be for you as well. And so I bring you Dr. Tobin Bell. So yes, it's uh, the old compassion in a t-shirt. Actually, I, I, I haven't, um, I, I've sort of slowed down this year. I was doing weekly episodes last year and this, this year I was just like, <laughs> oh, like it was, it was getting, so it was getting, getting all getting, the kit for it and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with any luck, you'll, um, you'll get me going again. And and actually this, mm -hmm. what, you, you like this shirt? It's um it's not a common color for me but uh, it's uh, a pinky <clears throat> pinky sort of <clears throat> mode. I can't really see the color in the light oh okay <laughs> yes well uh welcome dr tobin bell uh to compassion in a t-shirt uh, it, <laughs> it really is uh, delightful to to get to talk to you you're all the way over there in in manchester in the uk and mm -hmm. so uh i don't get to to sort of rub shoulders with the, the UK CFT as much, certainly not uh, across COVID and so on. I know you all got yeah. together at the end of last year, I think. Were you at the CMF conference at the end of last year? Up in Edinburgh, yeah. So it's Edinburgh yeah. last year and Birmingham this year, yeah. It's going to be Birmingham, right. I think, okay. so. yeah, that's what I've seen yeah. on the website. Yeah, I'm pretty committed to trying to get over there this year, I think. And mm -hmm. so uh, that, that'll be fun to to get together but um you really have uh established a, 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 a certainly a special interest but a lot of expertise in in this area of compassion focused therapy but also uh chair work and bringing yeah. sort of the air those two areas together and and um certainly um running a lot of workshops doing a lot of research uh and i i thought today what i'd like to do is just sort of sort of hear a little bit about sort of the journey through all of that, perhaps a little bit about mm. the CFT, um, perhaps chair work and how it can be brought to CFT, and then maybe some of your research and, and some some practical examples. Yeah, sure. But, but yeah, well, how, how did you, I suppose, sort of going back a little bit, though, you know, how did you find yourself, or what was your journey into psychotherapy, I guess, as, or a psychotherapist mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and CFT itself? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, like a lot of, a lot of therapists and psychologists, it sort of stems from personal experience. So I think that's always been there in the background. Um, I think I had the choice because I'm a nurse by background, and I had the choice at one point to be study to be a librarian or study to be a nurse, and I picked nursing, uh, and I picked Manchester for the football team. And yeah. it's the decisions sort of really we make. <laughs> I know, I know. It's sort of just took off from there really the kind of interest in health and I think the parts of nursing I like best were the time with with clients patients uh one-to-one -one, and just wanted to be more helpful and that took me to early intervention teams with people early experience of psychosis and community and then there was a really big push in the UK for psychological treatment for people at risk of psychosis and in Manchester it was really big so that to sort of swayed my interest and in CBT was the first training I did um you know it's it's great and still use it but I suppose it came across CFT just because almost hitting the perhaps the limits of CBT in terms of helping with things that were um unfixable I suppose because of the human condition mm. but also particularly when the head and heart didn't seem to match you know like and I think that's one of the the impetuses for Paul creating CFT that, um, you know, I kind of know this thing, but I don't feel it. 
So to start working more emotionally using the body. Um, and that sort of got me interested. Mary Welford is up in Manchester and she was really inspirational. And and then it kind of got going from there, really. Yeah, mm. the, the, uh, it's very similar for me, actually, that, that notion that uh, with, with CBT, the, the sort of people can talk about how they know that some of their thoughts perhaps aren't rational or, or kind of evidence-based or real, but they still feel you know, um, unhappy or distressed or mm. anxious or whatever it might be, that sort of head heart yeah. lag that you're referring to there. And CFT seems to really try to address that. I think I think the sort of personal professional interlink, really. I remember going on a, a retreat, like a silent retreat in, for mindfulness for a week. And then on the third day, they start to do compassion exercises and it just, like, things really change for me, I think. And, and, you know, really feeling it, I suppose, and learning by feeling it and experiencing it. Um, and then I remember like a point in my life when the sort of compassionate voice just sort of showed up automatically. <laughs> mm. Walking down a corridor, I remember particularly, and it just sort of showed up and said, oh, so it's OK. You know, don't worry. It used the sort of nickname that my dad calls me, Tobes, and I just heard it in my head. Yeah. Um and, you know, I was so self-critical when I was a kid, you know, it got me into all sorts of trouble. Um, but it just, something else came in its place. And I thought, well, you know, if I, if it works for me after that, then, and it's such a helpful way, mm. probably worth investigating. It's a powerful moment, isn't it? When the compassionate self, so to speak, just kind of arrives, I guess, just when you need it most. Those are some yeah. very special moments, I think, for us when they've arrived, but but certainly for when we're working with people and they're struggling away and they're trying to practice this stuff and doing the exercises and so on. And then one day it, it kind of happens and uh, mm. it, it's sort of hearing those stories. It, it's, all, it's always very sort of spine tingling, isn't it? When, when you hear the yeah. story of that, that part of themselves arriving on Definitely. the scene. And I think, I suppose just talking about it today, I suppose, the, the overlap of personal and professional, I suppose, has led me to being more interested in self-practice, self-reflection. I think that the belief that that is a good, because I do a lot, of, a lot of my work is training and supervision. I think learning via experience as a therapist, particularly with that self-practice, self-reflection model, I think is particularly helpful. I think that's born out of experience as much as, you know, um, academic reasoning. Yes, well, you you were part of the the authorship on on compa uh, compassion focused therapy from the inside out, and, and yeah. um, I'll actually pop the the link to that book in the in the notes below, I guess, so to speak, and and um, people might be interested in that because actually, yeah, it's a really I, I found that a great way to just work through the CFT steps in that self applied way and see what it actually feels like and see what what you notice as you as you're sort of delivering all of that for yourself. Yeah, just how hard some of the exercises are to do. You know, the things that seem so simple about breathing intentionally each day, <laughs> faced with challenges of family and professional life, it's just doing simple things are hard to do. And I think as a clinician, it's quite good to be reminded of that regularly. Yeah. That this stuff's difficult and it takes, you know, effort, motivation, commitment, support yeah. from others. It's both, isn't it? On the one hand, mm -hmm. it's recognizing that it's difficult and takes a lot of effort and it's hard to sneak into our lives and, and you know, that there's that side. And then there's that other side of sometimes there's this, there are these payoffs and you kind of feel it and you know oh, what that is like when, when all of a sudden, um, you know, you just slip into a soothing, breath, uh, soothing rhythm breathing exercise and settle settle the the sort of the body settle the mind and and start to think differently in a situation you know the, the sort of there's really kind of both those are really kind of wonderful to stay connected with as a therapist so uh, i always like to sort of hear other cft therapists sort of you know kind of describe cft i guess you know like how how would you kind of describe cft or you know your elevator pitch maybe or or how you oh, might goodness how you might even kind of uh, sort of give a give a rationale there to to a client yeah. or something like that i suppose i'd just sort of explore 
um, or maybe talk about just what happens when things kind of go wrong, really. So when things are difficult, you hit tough times, you experience suffering, just what happens next, really? Because mm. that difficulty, that suffering, I think, doesn't go away for any of us. And it's what occurs after that, you know, does what occur mean self-criticism? Does it mean avoidance? Does it mean um, inflicting the pain on other people? Or at that moment, could you be, could you be helpful rather than harmful? And I think that when Paul often sort of boils it down just to that bit, like, you know, can you be helpful rather than harmful? I think it's that. So when those tough times occur, would it be helpful to have a part of your mind, someone on your shoulder, someone at your back to feel safe, to feel supported? And, you know, how would, how would life be if you could, when you hit those difficulties and doubts that you inevitably will, through aging, through life, through having a tricky mind. Like, how would things be if you felt really safe and you felt really supported? What would that be like? Mm. And I think that, I don't know, for me, it's some of the essence of it, really. Yeah, kind of kind of sums, sums it up. I, I do love, you know, may I be helpful rather than harmful to myself and others. I do find that a really nice refrain almost for, for clients yeah. and, and people people learning and about it's quite realistic it's not it's you know it doesn't have to mm. be heroic actually like what, what and and then i suppose there's a discernment and reflection about what is helpful mm-hmm. and what needs help and then i suppose i was just talking to a client recently and they were that their their sort of refrain was you know first i've got to find out what hurts what hurts most and then within that hurt what's needed and then how do I meet that need, really? And I think that, you know, that's sort of just, well, that's perfect. Mm-hmm. What hurts? Yeah. Can I pay attention to it long enough to find out what's needed and what's skillful? And then can I practice bringing that to myself, accessing it from others, yeah. et cetera? That, that person just nailed the two psychologies of compassion. Exactly. <laughs> <Didn't they? laughs> the yeah. sen- sensitivity Absolutely. to suffering in self and others yeah. and the commitment to try to alleviate and prevent it. Basically, that they had that Absolutely. really um, intuitive wisdom there really about just just what we think of compassion in, in, in a sense. Yeah. Um, I, I love that when people have that uh, those those insights you know for themselves. No, I was just—I was just going to say. I suppose that <clears throat> I've moved more into academic field, and I'm—I'm I'm not a, a particularly skillful researcher, but I do love um, the research, qualitative research, where you get to hear those kind of experiences. And I think, like having that kind of snippet, that rich experience, is for me more valuable than anything. I think I'm predominantly a clinician. So hearing some clients' words, hearing how some of this theory that you can read about and build, how it actually lands with people and it lives in people um, and what they can tell you about the kind of interventions you're doing with them. I think for me, that's the most helpful as a clinician, but also the most interesting as a researcher for me. Mm. Um, so that's yeah. been my, I suppose, my interest in the last couple of years is sort of that sort of rich um phenomenological research on with clients on their experiences of cft hmm. yeah I'll, I'll i'll ask you a bit more about that as as we go along but um but yes it, in a funny sort of a way as therapists we are qualitative researchers aren't we because exactly, we're, yeah. we're trying to be you know we're trying to use inquiry we're trying to you know sort of do guided discovery we're trying to tap into the the, the wisdom and the experiences of the people that we're working with and and actually quite often they'll or usually they'll say things that just seem profound you know much more than what i might say Um, yeah but it's tough i was interested in your sort of sequencing there of you know that there might be some source of of pain or suffering or life difficulty and and your curiosity about you know what happens next it's interesting way of thinking about it I, I was certainly talking to someone this week whose father she'd had a very difficult uh, upbringing and her father was a very difficult person and 
she had a lot of anger in, in you know, sort of recalling all of that and and um and and as we've been working through some of that and and as some of that anger has has sort of you know somewhat subsided the next thing has been you know i was so stupid to be angry all that time you know what what's wrong with me that i couldn't just you know move on and forget him or you know whatever it might yeah. be so the, and so i guess more anger but but you know this time directed at the self so we yeah we have tricky uh, brains <laughs> yeah i suppose it i suppose it links to me to that idea of <clears throat> compassion being so closely linked to care and mammalian evolution of caregiving and care receiving and attachment so that you know what happens when you experience pain where do you go do you are you able to to return to that haven and are you able to use others caregiver later on compassionate self compassionate mind as that um secure base to kind of move off back into the what you want to do yes. so i think it's that bit of almost you you go out you you kind of hit difficulty you return you can get regulated supported you've got that support on your back that encourages you out repeat repeat <laughs> yes repeat repeat yes it reminds me of uh chris irons and charlie harriet maitland's cmt course and they show the um the visual cliff research yeah. where the the baby is sort of there on the perspex and they're perfectly safe but there's this visual cliff and and on the other side of the visual cliff is is the parent and the first thing is the parent shows the fear face sort of um and the baby stops and sort of looks around nervously and whatever versus what happens when the mother shows a, a smiling or or you know sort of safe face um and you know how how the baby feels able to to proceed to to get the toy mm. in in that instance but um yes th this is sort of i think what you're saying is that that we in cft we're starting to see can those various aspects start to to sort of be developed within ourselves actually yeah absolutely. i mean yeah well i suppose that the visual cliff experiment where it's the the baby has to move over a cliff towards a toy isn't it so that's right yes it also captures that bit about actually the toy is something you want and you know at that stage of life it's for you know that's the thing you know you really want this toy yeah. and i suppose think about what we want as adults like, and how how do we move towards things we really care about and that, that we value um yes. at different stages and i suppose it's that idea of that sense of affiliation support really does create courage to take risks yes. to move a bit further to reach out and try this stuff even yes. though the danger's there so i suppose it's that um again like what shows up when you hit the hit the difficulty if you had someone really encouraging supporting wise thoughtful caring for you how, what would you do where would you go not just kind of would it relieve your distress but like where would that take you yes just imagine the the possibilities there uh, if we were to have perhaps literally someone like that that encourages us yeah. encourages encourages us along uh, or um, you know sort of how, do, how might we offer that to ourselves so actually maybe this is a, a segue to chair work because in, in a way I think you know chair work is about trying to help people start to well understand and 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 develop and work with some of these different aspects of themselves so but but could you give us a, a sort of a, a bit of a sense of what chair work is now you know in terms of yeah. perhaps definitions of that or at least the how, how that all is practiced? yeah i mean it's been it's chair work's been around for over 100 years um as a method of healing and therapy and you know it's got its roots in psychodrama and then developed in gestalt therapy and um, the sort of process experiential methods of greenberg and uh, emotion focused therapy so it's got a it's it's been used all over the place in all different therapies cbt you know it's got a kind of heritage of sort of role plays and all sorts um and i suppose if you were to really define it it's just about using chairs their positioning and movement between them to support therapeutic processes and you know, the method could be used in any therapy for different ends really so mm -hmm. if it's using schema therapy or cft the 
they're slightly for different purposes. But I suppose it starts to point like, is it, you know, it starts to feel almost like a, not a therapy in itself, but it's definitely a, um, a particular way of dialogically working with the self, I suppose, because mm. such a core part of chair work is self multiplicity. I mean, you can use chair work with, you know, um, with others, with external relationships, but it's often the external relationships that you've internalized and you carry with you, like with an empty chair process. So there's often, you know, as part of the core of chair work, there are a few unifying processes that uh, go across all the different ways it's applied in different therapies. And that's sort of self multiplicity and separation is then usually animation of different parts. And you can animate different parts of the self in different chairs via um, personification. So it'd be like, imagine your critic over there on the chair, what it looked like, how does it sound, how does it move? But then with embodiment, you can then switch chairs and go over and then take the role of the critic and then really feel what it's like from the inside out. And then I suppose the final sort of process really is about getting these different parts to talk and dialogue. Mm. So it's often this sort of dialogical exchange between aspects of the self, self and therapist, et cetera, um, self and another. And I think that's where it starts to feel like the perfect sort of vehicle for CFT because we're talking about internal relationships, we're talking about self and other relationships, other self relationships, and CFT is so focused on making sure compassion flows in all these multiple directions and talks about how an external relationship gets internalized as critics and carers get internalized as compassionate voices. So it feels like the perfect vehicle for CFT in lots of ways. Mm. I, I, mm. I feel like it was possibly at a presentation you did at, uh, in the, at the New York summit or something like that. But I, I feel like I remember you talking about uh, the idea of, the, the the chair or one chair for the critic and another chair for the criticized and that yeah. always struck me as just so like that was a, a revelation that that not only is there a part of ourselves that is the critic but there's a part of ourselves that's on the receiving end of that and and is is the one being so um attackingly you know uh criticized in in that way and and to be able to sort of you know kind of really recognize separate you know kind of differentiate those aspects and and perhaps the different motives and mm-hmm. needs and so on of each of the different parts yeah i think it's spot on. i think it's that bit that differentiation and then externalization and the acknowledgement there are you know every kind of internal sort of message there's a sender and receiver and i think mm-hmm. again cft's got that language of social mentalities giving and receiving of social messages that designed for external relationships but play out internally and create these internal relationships Mm. um so i think there's something really powerful about in therapy if you hear someone say oh that's stupid to think about it dialogically and i think you know that that would be like a practical tip i suppose that's really helped me is is just think dialogically all the time so you hear someone say that's stupid or just think well it sounds like there's a part of you that's saying that's stupid but who are you calling stupid? So there's a part that's kind of receiving that. And then if you could get that out of your head and put them in chairs and separate them out, then you can see the diff- there's actually different emotions at play. So rather than someone saying, you know, I feel depressed and it's just all terrible. Um, actually, there's a part that is really angry, disgusted, disappointed. And then there's a part that receives that anger and disgust and feels beat down, etc. And then when you can separate and stand away from that, you can look at this relationship afresh, but you can also make comparisons to external relationships. Well, does this sound like any other relationship you've been in, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of gives you so many avenues. You could work on the angry bit. You could work on the the kind of defeated, depressed bit. You can work on the relationship. You can link it to other relationships then work back in time. You can address then external people where the voice has come from. So, sort of single chair work exercise can start to open up whole sort of fields of inner relating, I think. Yeah, inner relating and, and sort of the, the, the separate parts, but but how they relate to each other. I, I know yeah. often you'll you'll look at um, sort of the big three, or I guess, that ang- ang- anxious self um, or angry self, anxious self and sad self uh, and sort of, you know, kind of understanding the kind of the motives and, and various aspects of, of each of those. But then how they feel or relate 
towards each other as well and and how that yeah. all starts to to play out and often there's a a sort of a, a a rich complex kind of interplay that's just going on in that self to self relating i think it's just a the that exercise the multiple sales exercise just so helpful as a framework and you can almost start to formulate just using those three you know unpacking the threat system mm. so for example i mean i guess if you and i were talking we might think well which of those three threat emotions is is the go-to you know one of them is usually primary and dominant and then there's usually one or two that are are kind of not showing up to the party and then you can think well actually does that make sense given you know given our upbringing given our experiences that one emotion one sort of defense profile repertoire is potentiated and reinforced and others are tricky and then what are the needs that are lost and not heard or, or what's the healthy kind of energy or defense that's lost if you don't connect with that emotion that's mm. that's more at the back um mm. so i think it just causes a self-supervision question for therapists like what or for anybody like which of the three threat emotions is dominant and which is absent and yes. why does it make sense yeah yeah yes yeah, sort of understanding the the origins of some of that and and you know if we did get a little bit angry you know sort of as in, in our early lives how was that responded to by our caregivers or attachment figures or others around us and how might that now sort of start to influence where perhaps angry self you know sort of shows itself or doesn't um yeah of, exactly. often the person who's it seems to me I, I, i'd be interested in what you think about this but mm. it seems to me that often the person who is very aware of anxious self for example um or, or perhaps sad self or, or those that sort of thing you know some of really the work is but is with angry self you know how, how do we yeah. sort of yeah, yeah. work out what's happening there for angry self and for the person who's very very angry well maybe it's sadness that that actually mm. is is where the work might lie so yes that's yeah, it's definitely so it's often the the <clears throat> the missing piece and you talk about like you said how these parts interact and you know it's not that far away from some psychodynamic ideas of how these kind of forces rub up against each other and create conflicts internally um but i think yeah for example social anxiety you know you might you might try and reduce the anxiety and you know say cognitive therapy might be really helpful for things like that or you might do some i don't know some soothing practices that would help to regulate anxious threat but actually would would somebody feel more safe feel more able to deal with things would the compassionate thing be actually to build up kind of assertive anger healthy anger so they can hold off uh criticism they can manage threats that come their way and they can steady themselves um mm. so it's, it's often you're working with the emotion that isn't present yes initially yeah yes yes it's it's all of this and and of course you know anxious self is is very very anxious of angry about angry self because what if they yeah. what if they come in and mess everything up and and then angry self is kind of angry at anxious self because it seems so weak and scared and and vulnerable and so they sort of they all have these interesting interrelationships when you talk about those in in like they are like these mini cells like the inside out film i think when i started to do that intervention i really worried that like clients would think it's absolutely bonkers to talk about these different parts inside or find it really unhelpful in terms of you actually like separating these parts and equally you've got these different selves but i think what has been helpful for me personally is for doing the research asking people after these uh, interventions like how how do they find it what do they make sense of it what are they taking away and people actually really like this idea of self-multiplicity and the feedback from you know clients and the research is that this explains why i'm one thing and another this explains why i'm conflicted this explains why things feel all over the place actually this framework of self-multiplicity is actually really simplifying for me and normalizing so i think that's that's quite a reassuring message for therapists i think as clients like this stuff and find it helpful um, yeah. rather than disintegrating their sense of self you find sometimes that therapists you know learning this stuff can feel I guess anxious to implement it or or anxious about implementing it or perhaps even sometimes avoid the, the doing the sort of the chair yeah. work or the multiple cells work yeah definitely we did some research about 
clinicians' um, concerns about chair work. And I think, mm. you know, it's multiple really. It's, it's like either it's going to fall flat and the client won't engage at all, or if they do engage, then it's going to be too much and too overwhelming. Um, mm. But I suppose it's it's helpful to have feedback from the people that matter most, the clients, and actually they say, you know, initially it is really, <laughs> it is really strange and it is really emotive, but it's that, it's actually that strangeness that breaks sort of, I don't know, stereotype habits that people get stuck into, doing something new, uh, responding alive to the room and to what's going on. Um, but also kind of learning that you can tolerate these kind of big feelings. You can step in and step out. And I think the chair, the framework of the chair work, you, know, you enter quite a messy world of emotions, but you've got set chairs and that people learn they can kind of enter and leave, enter and leave enter and leave titrate their access and they can enter and leave it shifts things by stepping in and sitting down and shifts things by standing up and moving away so i think for clinicians knowing that there is this sort of period of weirdness at the beginning and then there is periods of high distress but actually clients really value being helped through that and the chair work process i think provides a structure to do that yes yes it, it it can have some of that discomfort, but it is the experiential embodying element to it that that really is so powerful. Um, when does it come in for you in CFT? So yeah, if we think about CFT question. with some of the, the psychoeducational elements, maybe at the start and some of the, the set pieces of, of CFT, what's your thoughts with that? Yeah, it's interesting. There's not a great deal written about like when and where in chair work in general. So I think... The motion focused therapy there there's a book recently that sort of said you know not till sort of three third or fourth session and i think the idea is that the relational base is there but then my colleague matthew pew is doing single session chair work and mm. we kind of we wrote a piece um on a client experiencing that so i think i think we don't know when best to do it i think to be honest but i think I think it can be used in different ways to different degrees. So I wouldn't be doing, say, a self-critic chair work early, for like at the beginning, or the multiple sales. But you can start by using it at any stage of CFT, I think. So I'd use it, say, at socialization um, about compassion. So rather than sort of going through in detail what, what each component or competency is of compassion, to tap into people's intuitive wisdom, I might say, you know, say I was working with you, Stan, I might say, you know, could you imagine next to you in this chair, next to you in your room or in the space next to you, there's somebody you care about. And um, if you picture them there and get a sense of their presence, like, how would you show up? What would you do? How would you feel towards them? And if you start to help them, how do you know how to be helpful? Um, what do you think they might be feeling in this situation? Um, like, how might you use your voice or how might you, how might you use your body? Um, what would you want for them? How does that feel? Mm. And so all those kind of things, just doing it kind of in a live way and yeah. experiential way. I think that seems to land quite well, but it, mm. it's a good way of teaching some of compassion and poems and showing how people have got an intuitive wisdom about it. Mm. But it also starts to socialize to the idea of you can use these chairs. It's weird, but it's kind of helpful. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you. You're telling me about that. I mean, I, I sort of do use chair work and, and some of the other embodiment and acting kind of strategies and so on. But often for those later sort of set pieces around multiple yeah. selves and, and self-criticism, but but actually, um, yes, that's interesting. You, you, if As you get kind of uh, more more of the, the kind of the expertise around it, or well, maybe it's more just the feeling happy and confident and whatever yeah. you can just be really agile with it and and use it in all sorts of possible moments you know not not least an early moment where you're trying to think about you know like what might be the the body posture or the physical kind of sensations of compassion well just imagine that someone's there sitting next to you in the chair and so on yeah. and, and and right and I, I guess that would very nicely just sort of orient the client too to the idea that we'll be using chairs you know that, that that'll be kind of part yeah. of it going going forward Definitely. that's probably the most helpful tip in i mean in, in cft chair work is that priming the pump really and kind of going where the flow is easiest so you know you might start with um okay so before we think about you let's kind of just think about i know you've got depression say before we think about your depression let's just think how we'd help somebody together who had depression 
do you know anybody who's got depression we could think about helping put them on the chair or could we use an archetypal figure like just somebody who's got depression say my next client coming in if you were to imagine them having depression um and let's just picture in the chair and let's you and i think about how we'd help someone with that so you start the flow if if kind of self to others easier which it usually is um, particularly if you find someone that they've got an easy relationship with and then it's about well how about now you kind of swap over and we imagine that you're in the chair um mm. and we imagine seeing you and how you would look we now know what to say we now know what to do we're going to experience loads of blocks to doing this but you know we we know the we know the road kind of thing mm. um yeah. and other sort of stay exposing to it or we can work with the blocks as they arise but mm. it seems to work a lot easier and then also because you're doing it as a team if they get stuck you could say mm. could i speak and could i model and i think yes. i think in my chair work uh i don't know development I think I've been much more willing to work more as a team and when they get stuck to to model it. You can ask lots of Socratic questions, and that's brilliant, but I think modeling it, giving it sometimes is a really powerful step to do. And it also helps when you hit loads of blocks. Yes. Yeah. I, I appreciate that as well. I, I you, you know that it you you are very inspiring to listen to, actually, Tobin, with all of that. I mean, it, it really does as uh I mean I've been doing this sort of work for a long time but just to listen to you say that it, it really does feel inspiring and and all sorts of possibilities come to mind in terms of you know where this this might be applied you mentioned blocks and uh we you and i and and alison dixon and james kirby managed to write a paper <laughs> together a qualitative study so definitely appreciated your uh and alison's input from that qualitative research point of view, but that was about working with fears, blocks and resistances. And one of the things was these experiential techniques around chair work or, or sort of other things that, that the therapists that we uh, sort of questioned told us about. Mm. What are your thoughts there about the application of chair work with fears, blocks yeah. and resistances? Yeah. Well, I suppose one, if we go back to that example of say, you've primed the pump, you've worked with someone with depression, then you've imagined the client self, vulnerable self, depressed self from the chair and you're giving compassion. And I suppose what you can do is you could ask the person to go over and then receive it. So, you know, you've given care on one side, you've been the sender of signals, but then how about you go over and receive it? And as you're receiving it, you can say if it lands, which would be lovely, but if it doesn't land, you could say the reasons why, you know, like, oh, I don't deserve it. Um, you know, I, sh I shouldn't be kind of caring for myself. I should be there for others. This is really selfish. Mm. Um, and then I suppose then you can come back, switch roles again and come back to the compassionate chair, sit with the therapist and say, well, let's see if we can help Tobin or Stan over there in that chair. He's feeling like it's really selfish to receive care. Let's see if we can help him why it makes sense. Because over here, separate from there, from the compassionate chair, why does it make sense that Stan would feel that he needs to give rather than receive where does that come from how does that make sense from what we know about stan's life for example and then let's tell him that so you know stan i think i think this comes from actually you know you having to tune into others over and above yourself and etc cetera, etc cetera. Hmm. i think that's one way of kind of doing it. it's that you hmm. keep going backwards and forwards and giving receiving then you can go back and receive it and keep expressing it another chair work mechanism is um actually asking someone to go and embody the the block or the fear so yeah. if we say we're working with that block again or fear that i must be caring to others i'd say well could i just speak to the part of you that that, that says i must care for others and i'd say you know stan could you just make a movement and just sit in that position and as you sit in there we need to take the role of this part that says i've got to care for others and i'd ask you some questions in that role like you know how how long have you been kind of saying this to stan how long have you been here how what are your fears if if stan was to let care in what would be your concerns um what are your concerns about him coming to therapy um who you know when did you first come into action and with with whom did you first start to kind of feel like stan needed to do all this caring so you can mm. validate explore understand different mm. parts in that way too in a more of an interviewing style mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's it's it's wonderful stuff. You, we, we've we've sort of touched along the way some of your research. You've mentioned uh, using qualitative research to explore clients' perspectives, I guess, on share work yeah. and how that felt to them. And we just mentioned there exploring therapists' perspectives on on you know how they might work with fears, blocks, and resistances, and and I guess chair work being a part of that. What what a what t- tell us I guess a little bit I guess about your your research you know what what sorts of things have you done or yeah. found there? Yeah, I mean it's mainly been um, interviewing clients after receiving receiving chair work. Really, that's been the most recent ones. But it's I suppose it's about clinicians too interviewing them about how they find delivering certain things, um, and what they value about the fears and the blocks for example we've got some at the moment with some um students where we're in, where one is uh compassionate other for people with social anxiety we're asking about how people find using that to support them in social situations see them with and breathing for people with depression we're doing one at the moment with um compassionate other in chair work so rather than it being an image um so the compassion and other image, you know, you picture somebody who's perfect for you and caring for you. We do that in chair work instead. So imagine outside on that chair, there's somebody who's perfect and caring for you. And then you can swap over and become that compassionate other and you embody the compassion other. And then you look back at yourself and give yourself that care. Um, and then you can swap backwards and forwards, giving, receiving. So I suppose it's like, what, what does that add? You know, does chair work add anything different than the imagery? Does embodying and like, like literally taking the seat and the physicality of the compassionate other seeing through their eyes does that provide anything above the imagery work Mm. yeah is it helpful for people who find imagery tricky to do more embodiment and enactment Mm. embodiment and enactment yeah Mm. yeah no that is very interesting starting to um uh kind of disentangled some of these different elements and and how they mm. how they work and what they contribute and 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 also too i think that one of the things i do love about cft is uh, you know already there's there's sort of many ways in isn't there for any given person yeah. there's a lot of ways in to sort of really try to cultivate this part of ourselves and and absolutely the the, the chair work the embodiment and enactment seems to be a very important piece of that I think a lot of CFT has evolved like that. So Paul talks about the, you know, trying to do some of the exercises initially that he developed and then people not liking it and needing something else. And people come up with those idea of tennis balls to hold and smell and, you know, things like that. And then the idea of soothing objects. And so I think it's being receptive to the people who matter most, people receiving the therapy and actually they can, tell us a lot more i think than we can get from just thinking about what might be helpful yeah yes it's very powerful stuff and and clients seem to or or the people that we're working with seem to um while awkward at first they seem to to receive it pretty well and find it to be useful it's a little bit about therapists i guess having that confidence or even courage to to give this stuff a try and and to you know carefully but curiously work through with with the chair work if people were interested in in learning more about chair work i guess but also chair work in cft where where, where could they go to to find out yeah. some more so uh, as part of the foundation compassionate mind foundation run at least once a year we've got two this year one in person which would be lovely to do in person again in manchester um cft chair work so that's for two days mm-hmm. um and there's one online this year and then i work with my colleague matthew Pugh, who's written brilliant he writes brilliantly on chair work particularly cbt chair work um and we have sort of chairwork.co.uk which is our sort of organization if you go on that okay. website there's loads of resources we've tried to write down not scripts but sort of prompt points or dance steps we kind of refer to them as of okay for the, for the chair work but like you know like good dancing you need to let go of the steps and listen to the music type thing i see um yes. but there's there we do we do training on there and we do like a three-day um sort of immersive chair work sort of retreat style thing mm, um, okay all right well i'll definitely definitely include all of those in the the, the show notes i guess and and people can can check all of that out and I'll, I'll i'll do a little 
search of your main PAPS papers and, and pop them up there. I, I was interested. I read the single session uh, chair work example, which was very oh, yeah. interesting because one of the things that that found was that, you know, actually, even in a single session, you know, we worry about the relationship and will people feel safe and engaged enough to do it. But actually, sometimes doing the exercise and the chair work can help to facilitate good engagement or yeah. relational connection and, and so on. And yeah, that definitely. was interesting. <clears throat> yeah, I think it goes back to some research about, I remember it found that behavioralists were one of rated one of the most warm, warm uh, therapist groups in some research. And I was always struck by that. I think, why does why that make sense? That, you know, the relationship's not maybe forefronted as it is in other therapies, but maybe it is doing things like, you know, to get someone to do something like walk on a height or to touch a spider if you're scared of it, doing it with somebody and sort of showing up and you modeling it and taking them through it and coaching them through it maybe that it is the doing it that builds a relationship as much as a relationship sort of allows the doing of it so i think they're yeah. very interactive those kind of ideas I, I don't know why but i just have the image of what my son when he was little and and you know the the um joy on his face you know looking up at me when he did accomplish something and when, when he actually yeah. when we did something together even though at first scared about it he, he you know i think it was like very uh a moment of connection really you know he sort of would look up and just be um yeah. beaming with joy You're useful dad <laughs> <laughs> well he's as i was telling you before we started he's he's uh about to turn 18 so uh all of that joyful up looking up at me with with glee mm. has uh has, is behind sure us. Now, now, he, <laughs> he still he still looks at me with glee but it's more he looks down at me now rather than up at me so there is that but uh tobin i yeah, that was really wonderful and as i say inspiring i'm, I'm definitely going to take that away that those ideas uh not least you know just integrating some of this stuff perhaps early on in, in a careful way in a curious way but in and around some of that psychoeducation and even connecting with with ideas around what is compassion it, it sort of seems like a, a, a sort of a no-brainer really that that's a, a wonderful way to really connect in the moment with with what is compassion so thank you very much for giving up your time and being willing to mm -hmm. to chat i i really appreciate it oh, nice to see you Stan. thank you for inviting me thank Thank you very much.